morning, uh, Eagle Brook history continues. In 1927, Eagle Brook was growing. More students, a new field, a tennis court, Thurston Chase married Hilly. Mr. Gibbs didn't join the school on hikes to the rock. When he thought no one was looking, he sat down, his head in his hands. There was no cure for leukemia. He told teachers, take the boys off for a picnic the day I die. He wanted them to experience death as part of nature. That spring, the inevitable day arrived, and the school picnicked at a farm. Boys played with newborn sheep and goats. At Mr. Gibbs' funeral, the road was lined. Eaglebrook boys and faculty, village friends, Valley Farmers, Frank Boyd, and all of Deerfield Academy boys and faculty, Eaglebrook's band marched down from school playing Nearer My God to Thee, followed by the coffin. When the service ended, a boy took a rose, climbed to the rock, and lay it in a nook that faced the cemetery. Thurston and Hilly bought Eaglebrook. Mr. Gibbs' wife wrote, Parents, an older gentleman of mature experience, a friend of Mr. Boyden's, will join the faculty as an informal assistant to balance their youth. Thurston was 24, Hilly, 21. 1928, Thurston received a letter from one of Mr. Gibbs' friends inside a check with instructions, build your boys a swimming pool. Hilly organized a dedication. Eaglebrook's band, dressed in red jackets, blue knickers, and bright red stockings, led a procession from the lodge to the pool. Inside, a row of boys lined the deck. Thurston spoke words of gratitude, gave a signal, ropes came off, boys leaped the splash, soaked Hilly, Thurston, and their guests. The older gentleman hired to balance their youth was among the soaked. He reported to Mr. Boyd that Hilly was a troublesome woman. Almost nightly, he walked to Deerfield with new accounts of her escapades. Before the year was over, he resigned after an attack. On an evening while a teacher read Oliver Twist to the boys, that gentleman burst into the lodge shrieking about supernatural beings that tripped him on the road in the dark. They endeavored to suffocate me, the poor man wailed. Boys were leaping to their feet, pushing past him, hands over noses, yelling, Wood kitten, wood kitten. 1929, Hilly and Thurston built a new building. Three stores, a dorm, a dining room, an infirmary, all in one building. Hilly planned a Halloween party. Jewels with rolled up newspapers, apples in tubs for border for bobbing, a house of horrors, witches screeching, feel the eyeballs, and plunging boys' hands into bowls of slimy peeled grapes. The stock market crash did not interfere with Hilly's plans for a Christmas party. Her pony, Pinto, wearing antlers, pretending to be a reindeer, arrived with Thurston as Santa and a sled full of gifts. Thurston's father, a congregational minister, told the Christmas story. At the end, he lit a large candle and in a booming voice called out, As one light enkindleth another, nor grows less, so nobleness enkindleth nobleness. The boy sang Adeste Fidelis and lit, lit candles from his. 1930, Thurston announced, this will be a bleak year. The financial crisis worsened. He was glad that Mr. Gibbs had raised tuition to $1,200. He wrote parents about new charges, $1 to pick up a package at the post office, $10 for a swimming lesson. He asked for their help. You will be the greatest assistance to us by enthusiastically recommending the school to your friends. He wanted addresses. We'll send copies of the Hearth, a school newspaper, without charge to them. 1931, the Chases refused to let financial worries interfere with school life. A warm day, spring and fall, in groves of trees in the center of campus, boys in twos and threes scratched out circles for games of marbles. A Hearth editor described the game. A boy crouched and surveyed the ring. At last, he selected the place to shoot. Putting the marble between his thumb and index finger, he took careful aim, then shot, cracked, one marble out. It was the other boy's turn. He didn't take his time, but shot right away, cracked, out went another marble. Teachers feared, too much marble playing will affect grades, boys reminded them. Mr. Gibbs always said, what you do outdoors will lead to scholastic success indoors. 
1932 to economize thirst and create a dump for trash on the hillside. The dump caught fire when wind spread flame to surrounding brush. Thurston sprinted to the site. Within minutes, he organized the boys into shovel brigades. Some scooped dirt into buckets. Others dashed with the buckets to Thurston, who, with a few teachers and some of the older boys, was throwing dirt onto the flames. The fire spluttered out. Thurston said, no matter the expense, we'll send trash to the town dump. That winter, a teacher introduced boys to hockey. He loaded them into his car and headed into the valley to search out a pond where they could skate. All were new to the game, except for Bill Whipple, who skated circles around everyone, puck flying along on his stick. That spring, Bill Whipple died in a car crash. 1933, the Whipples wanted their son remembered forever young at Eagle Brook, perhaps a pond. In September, boys marveled at what to them looked like a lake. School has completely changed. In a single summer, they said Bill would love to have skated here. On a winter day during fifth period Latin class, someone came running toward the schoolhouse, shouting about water, a two-foot stream of water pouring from the bottom of the dam. Come quick, he yelled. The whole school tore out of the building to find teachers handing out sacks. Frantic instructions, sandbags might plug the leak. There was yelling, open the drain, relieve the pressure. Thurston sent someone to the village to warn that 900,000 gallons of water might be on the way downhill. Boys who had filled the sandbags were dragging logs to hold them in place. Others were carting their mattresses down to plug the leak. Finally, Thurston said there's no hope of saving the dam. Boys sank, spirits sank. This is the saddest day in the history of Eagle Brook. 1934, the pond, rebuilt over the summer, had a new dam of thick packed clay. Alumni returned and said, Mr. Gibbs, our school is changing just the way he wanted it to be. Uh, one enrolled his son in the class of 1942. Before graduation, boys chose a good fellow, a friend of all, like Bill Whipple. Some grabbed his hands, some his feet back and forth. They swung until, on the count of three, their good fellow flew off into the pond. At graduation, the six forms stood to sing Eaglebrook's first school song from the lodge and from Gibbs House and Cubies too, and 1935. A harsh winter left two miles of the river jammed with ice that in some places towered 40 feet, matching the trees along the bank in height. Then rain began to fall, torrents of rain, and by afternoon the river fed by melting ice and snow was overflowing its banks. In the village, water rose five feet and kept on rising even more. Boys from Eaglebrook joined rescue squads, helping townspeople move possessions to second stories. We waded in ice cold water up to our hips, one boy said. Hilly in a canoe paddled from house to house, carrying off anyone stranded by the flood. At one house, Pinto swam back and forth, taking a mother and three children to dry ground. By night, rumors were spreading the upstream dam could burst, and 52 townspeople piled into their cars to spend the night at Eagle Brook. At midnight, we clambered out of our beds to make room for the refugees, a tired boy wrote to his parents. 1936, the Depression continued. Boys were thinking of ways to make money. We're a school of entrepreneurs, Thurston said. One boy set up a shoe shine business. One waxed skis. Another had a photography business. The hearth ran a headline, win one dollar, finish the limerick, second prize, 25 cents. The whole school began to create last lines. There once was a sharp whiskered kitty who from a back fence held a ditty. The minister said as he whipped out of bed and the winner of the dollar wrote, Good kitty, no ditty, have pity. Limerick writing had become a fad. There once were two cats from Virginia. Each thought that there was one cat too many. So they started to fight and to scratch and to bite. Now instead of two cats, there aren't any. And so that is the end of this uh, round of Eagle Book. <laughs> <laughs>